Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Ignite podcast. Uh, Today, I've been joined by Matthew Mackey. Mate, welcome to the call. Hey, thanks for having me, Josh. No worries, mate. So uh, just to set the scene, I'll start the conversation, maybe let everyone know a little bit about you and your journey to date. Yeah, so, well, it's been a long and torturous journey, as my wife would often tell me. Uh, So I'm I'm the uh, executive director for the Coffee and Commercial Management team uh, at Arcadis, uh, which I've been here five years now. Obviously not Australian. Uh, I've uh, been in Australia now for 11 years, working and uh, living in Australia with my family. Uh, prior to that, I did 15 years in the UK. Uh, and yeah, why did I move out to Australia? Well, the GFC for one, uh, which incidentally, it's only Australia that calls it the GFC. Uh, everywhere else calls it the recession or any number of other terms, uh, but Australia likes to abbreviate things. So yeah, two years in the GFC in the UK in the deep recession and then moved out here uh, 11 years ago and haven't really looked back since um and yeah spent the last five years with Arcadis. yeah good mate and maybe like so your current role with Arcadis, like what sort of stuff are you doing like i know we caught up last week you're on a bit of a road show having a chat to clients and that sort of stuff like what what are you, what are you doing with your clients and within Arcadis at the moment yeah so uh, i think people who are familiar with Arcadis will recognize that it's uh you know it's an engineering uh, consultancy uh, but there are a number of different spokes to the wheel, of which uh, I'm responsible for one, which is the, the cost management team to come to Quantity Spain. Uh, and the opportunity I was given here was uh, you know, Arcadis is a big global brand, global player, uh, 29,000 people uh, across the world, of which there are about 4,000 cost managers. Uh, so that makes us the biggest, uh, if not the biggest, certainly the top three in terms of size when it comes to QS and cost management. Uh, and the opportunity I was given in Australia was to start the, the QS team in Australia. So that's the kind of journey that we've been in, uh, been on in the last five years. Uh, started off with just two of us walking through the door uh, from Jacobs uh, five years ago. Uh, we're now pushing a team of 20. We're going to be about 30 people by the end of this year um, with plans to grow exponentially beyond that over the next two or three years to become a, you know, a, a real co- a competitive business unit in that market. So uh Exciting times, uh, you know, we, we started doing very small projects to start with, like HSBC, uh, you know, branch fit outs and that kind of thing. And now we're, we're talking about projects like Sydney Metro, we're talking about, we've worked on Open Airport, uh, we're working on residential schemes up and down the country. So we've gone from really small stuff and now kind of punching, what I would still say is punching above our weight a little bit, just in terms of our size and our brand strength. But yeah, that's the, that's the journey and it's, uh, it's been, you know, it's, it's been quite exciting. Yeah, mate, awesome. I'm keen to, I'm actually keen to dive into that. Like, I think it's a growth and growing a team and growing a business is always like, you know, there's thousands of different ways to skin a cat, right? Mm-hmm. So I'm sort of curious about, you know, your journey, like two people coming in, essentially a startup within a, a global organization. Like what, what did you do first? Like, how did you, how did you sort of approach that, that process and that, you know, probably sometimes a daunting task of going, okay, well, how, yeah. how do we do this thing? Yeah, well, I, I suppose when you're in a business like Arcadis, uh, you know, they were willing to do the investment in the first place, which is which is great. So you've got that kind of, uh, you've got that support network uh, that kind of underpins everything else. And you're in a much bigger business. So it's not like, you know, we started in our garage and we had to, you know, we've remortgaged our houses and all that kind of thing. So we didn't have that, that stress, which probably gave us a little bit more freedom to try different things. Um, that said, uh, it does give you an element of pressure as well because you're in a much bigger business. You've got all these different business units that are hitting certain metrics. And even though everyone kind of understands that we're new, that we're a bit of a startup and we've got a, and there's a bit of investment that goes alongside that in terms of like your low, lower utilization or that kind of thing. All the people in finance don't necessarily recognize that. They're still looking at spreadsheets. So there's a slightly different pressure to in, in, in terms of being successful. Um, but Arcadis has been overall great for us because it's it's given us that 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 um, that springboard, if you like, in terms of where we kind of develop into now. Um, but yeah, where do we start? It was just about walking through the door and seeing if we could win some work. Was basically it. And there's probably an element of naivety to that. Um, I think when we first came across, I mean, Arcadis, um, like I said, is a, you know, a very large cost consultancy, and I used to work for Arcadis. Um, back in the UK, so I was very familiar. But when you're setting up a business in a new region, you kind of think everything is already in place. Now, all the stuff about invoicing, finance, all the controls, they're all in place. But how we deliver a QS service and a new service offering in Australia isn't kind of there. So, and I think with our naivety, 
we just started, we came in, we started delivering stuff and then we realized we actually need to start building some processes. And we're five years in now. And as we're growing the business, um, we're finding, oh, we don't actually have a process for that. So we should build that now before we have too many people coming in. Yeah. Um, uh, but it also, it's also allowed us to try and build stuff to a certain extent by committee, uh, having a lot of people buy into what we're doing and actually try and lead the evolution rather than just telling people what they need to do. And that's created a, you know, um, a, a lot of buying from the team members in terms of what direction we're going. Uh, it does create a counter problem as well on the very fact that everybody feels that they then can have a say on stuff. And after a while, you've got to try and make a captain's call and say, hear what you're saying, but this is the direction we're going in. But having that kind of uh, that format and that forum where everybody feels like they can engage actually makes it really quite powerful. And it's probably allowed us to accelerate, especially in the last 12 months, accelerate further because we kind of have everybody on the bus already or most people on the bus. Uh, means we're not trying. It means I'm not trying to, you know, sell a vision that I've got to convince people of. People are already kind of living and breathing the vision and and helping drive. So you know, it's uh, it, there's a number of challenges that come with setting up a business in in Arcadia, but there's a, a quite a bit of freedom as well. To an extent. Yeah, mate. And you talk a bit about vision. So did you come in sort of day one? Did you spend some time actually working out what does this thing look like in the next three to five years, or did you literally just go, all right, we need to find some work and you know, just head down and that, that came later? Like what sort of drove um, you and fueled you? Probably a bit of both. Um, I mean, the good thing about a vision is it's kind of where you want to get to. It's not how you're going to get there necessarily. Yep. Um, so we had an idea of what we wanted to try and do. We were very clear on the very fact that we wanted to compete in what is a very commoditized market. There are a lot of established players with with lots of brand strength and we're, you know, we're a relative minnow in comparison but we wanted to try and push the envelope. We wanted to do things differently. And ultimately, it all came back to culture. We wanted to build a really, really good culture. Uh, and, you know, we've been really successful in, in regards of that in some instances and not so successful in others. It's, you know, it's, it's a constantly evolving thing. But having worked at larger, you know, QS organisations uh, and, and organisations like Arcade, I've, I've seen the good, the bad and the downright ugly in terms of culture. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I've seen what works and, I've, and I know the people who I would think back on my career of who I, who I would follow through a brick wall and the people I would let them run, I would let them run into the wall and not, <laughs> not support them, not follow them, not support them at all. Uh, and we wanted a kind of culture where there was, where there was a lot of trust and, it, it, and people felt like they were part of something. So that was, well, that was kind of the driver. How we actually end up getting there was slightly different. It was more about let's win some work, let's see what we can start to go over, let's see... Yeah, well, let's win the first project. Then, right, what's the second project? Now, let's find a client who can give us more than one project. How do we build those kind of relationships? And some of those are born from relationships we've had in the market for a while. And then others is new stuff, a new client. How do you position with those clients? How do you go and sound different to our competitors who are all selling very, very similar services and selling very, very similar stories? So, um, so it's probably two speeds to a certain extent. To an extent, and it's now after four or five years, we're probably, and we get into a kind of size, some kind of scale. We're now seeing that that vision and how we do things are kind of closer together than they perhaps were right at the start. Yeah, I mean, and it's it's interesting. It's like you know, what do you do first, cart before the horse? And you can spend all this time on this grandiose vision, but at the end of the day, like you've got to go out and pound the pavement. Exactly. And was, Exactly. And and was it sort of you know new clients or did you lean on existing relationships or did you go around within Arcadis and say hey, what sort of work are we doing for existing clients and yep. can, so can we all, leverage all, that? All the above, uh, all the above. And one thing that we found, uh, you know, particularly in Arcadis in Australia, is that it has been just as hard uh, yep. to position internally within the business for clients we have in other business units as it is to go and find new clients out in the open market. Interesting. Um, because it, it, at the end of the day, um, you know, that, that's not meant to be negative about arcade, it's because at the end of the day, we're talking about people, right? Yep. And you've got people who are operating in a much larger business and they've got relationships with clients that they've had for years. Just because I turn up wearing an arcade's hat doesn't yep. necessarily mean, that, oh, we should use you for all our quantity thing services. I instantly have trust because you all share the same brand. That's what, as a business, we want to believe that because we're all wearing the same badge, we should just all cross sell, but we're people. And we're based on trust and we and we and we operate based on relationships. So we ha- it is just as hard. Or I want to say just as hard. It's there is there is a, a period of time that you've got to spend building the relationships internally to build that trust 
before that flow through of work starts coming through. You can't yeah. just expect to turn up and say, I know we're in an arcade is out, therefore give us all the work. It's not going to happen. Yeah. Um, so that means we've, uh, in a way, you kind of target yourselves differently. You look at what you think you can reasonably go out in the external market, what kind of clients you want in the external market and how you can position for that. And then you look at well, what's internal and how do we position for you know for some of those big infrastructure projects uh, you know that Arcadis works on. How do we position ourselves as the the QS of choice for when those cost estimating roles come up? How do we make our guys internally think we should use you know the QS team? Um, and you know in some cases they you know the parts of the business that come to us for everything, or the parts of the business that it's a bit of a slow burn because we haven't built the trust yet. So um, it's, we're all creatures of habit. We're all human. Trust is the, is the main thing. It's and it's so true, mate. Like it's you know, you, you do think that like um, you bolt on a new part or a new team or a new service offering, and it's going to be operational within day one. Like it's it's yeah. almost no. It's like a it's a mini startup within yeah. an existing organization. And you're right, that trust piece is so important. Whether mm. whether it's an external client that you're trying to coax across, or um, you know, it's an internal team. How? Yeah. But that trust piece, how? How did you go about building that? Like, was that just that's? I mean, obviously, it's over time, but were there certain mm. metrics or certain things that you intentionally did to accelerate that, or was it just you know you sort of sat back and waited? Um, probably a combination of both. It, it, it does all come down to time. I mean, just because we've sat down and had a meeting with somebody and said, "Here's our okay, built here's, here's our experience. Here's what we can deliver," doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to get the next job that you know, that, that, that comes off the cabaret. So, um, so the, it, it is just about building that, doing the hard yards. It, it is no different in a way than meeting an external client or developer and wanting to sell your services and building that relationship. He's not going to give you the first project. He's certainly not going to give you the first major project that comes up. They're going to try you out first. And that's what, um, you know, and that's probably where we are now over the last five years is that we've done a lot of small stuff. We've built some credibility in the business. We've been winning work in our own right, getting our brand established within the business, let alone externally within the market. And now we're having more and more parts of the business come to us and said, can you give us fees for this or give us hours for this? Or how do you approach this problem? So that's becoming, um, uh, you know, certainly more frequent. Um, and I, I never wanted to, to build a business unit that was only doing internal arcade work. Yeah, for sure. Um, I'm sure there are some people in my business who disagree with me and said, well, you could be doing all our cases work and you've got a business there on its own. But I wanted, I always wanted to be able to build a business that could stand on its own two feet. Uh, and if we can do that with external clients um, and then we get a lot of flow through work from our cases, then that's, um, that's, you know, that's, the, that, that's the cream on top to a certain extent. That's the stuff that will allow us to grow while we're still trying um you know um, face off with the market and deal with external clients yeah awesome to to the growth piece and to you know you talk you've talked a lot about culture um and like i'm sure there's been stuff that's gone well and i'm sure there's been stuff that hasn't gone well um, (laughs) because it's you know it's dealing with people and people are we're we're all weird creatures um Mm. what like in terms of your um, I, let's call it success in terms of growing a team with a good culture. Like, what do you think has worked well for you? So, um, communication is definitely the top one. Um, it's being accessible. Um, it's making sure that if people have got an issue, you know, whether it's a direct line manager or, or, or me, you know, that, that they feel that they can reach out and with any issues that they may have. Uh, that constant communication. I mean, we, we've got probably seven. In some research, we've probably got too many internal meetings, but we have meetings where we talk about our quarterly performance, we talk about the always line of active vision and where we want to get to this year and how does that look uh, look like against the three-year vision, the five-year uh, vision and, our, and all our goals. Uh, we have something called the, the showcase where that's got nothing to do with work, that's got nothing to do with project wins, that's, that's purely people getting together for an hour and somebody running uh, a session, they could be a graduate, they could be a director, it doesn't really matter. And people present what they did at the weekend, what we did as a team last week, you know, some networking event that we went to. So it's all more social stuff. But the whole point of that is for everybody to get to know each other better and therefore build trust to a certain extent. So it's all about making sure that you know, we're constantly communicating. Uh, our case is very good, but it's got a, a quarterly survey called the All Boys Survey that everybody inputs into. And we all get okay. results from that drilled down to our business unit. So we can see what people are saying they're really happy with and what people are not very happy with. 
Um, in a team of when you've gone from like the last three years, we've gone from like 15 people to nearly 20. And every time somebody comes in, that fluctuates all the results. So for like two years, all the scores were going up and we were like, yep, now yep. this, we're the best cut, we're the best business <laughs> unit. And then two people join and somebody gets disgruntled and then all the, pri- all the, point, uh, all the scores drop. And it's like, oh my God, what we're doing wrong, cultures d- down the pan. But it, when you're a small number, it means, you know, all you need is one person to be slightly upset on that day to put a more negative score. And it, ru- it almost ruins the trajectory of the scores to a certain extent. Yeah, so yeah. it works better in more established business units where you're talking about 50, 60, 200 people or whatever. Um, but uh, but we but because of all that, what I'm trying to get to with that is with all that communication means that there's plenty of avenues for people to talk and for people to say what you know how whether they're happy, whether what they're not happy with, what they want to try and progress to. Look at talk about career path and all that kind of thing. And some people engage in that more readily than others, and other people probably need a bit more, you know, um, dragging towards the water hole more than anything else. Yeah. Um, but um, but yeah, that communication and being that clarity of vision. Um, I mean, the vision that we started with, we've tweaked it a little bit, but it's still the same vision we had five years ago. Because a good vision should always be something that you're striving towards, and it should be very very difficult to achieve. Particularly yep. in a competitive market, because as soon as you know we raise the bar on something, or some one of our competitors raises the bar, you've everybody pushes themselves to get to that same that that new requirement, that new standard. Which means if you want to stay at the top, you've got to push that bar up even further. You can't be doing the same thing. You can never crack the formula in, in terms of success. So by doing that. Um, you know, by pushing things forward, um, everyone wants to try and catch up. So it's yeah, you know, that's why I say vision should never really be obtainable. It should be measurable in a way of like, can we get there? What does yep. it look like? But even when you if you meet those metrics, you change the metrics again to you know for, for the vision to still be relevant. I've never been a believer of that you change the vision every four years because the vision should be the vision. The yeah, yeah. Be. The it's metrics may change. Yeah, how you measure it may change, but. The vision itself should be, you know, if it's a good vision, it should be relevant always. Stand the test of time. Yeah. yeah. Um, so staying on the, the culture piece and the open communication, that sort of thing, like, you know, I've worked in numerous organisations where, you know, it only takes one person who is a bit disgruntled, who is a bit frustrated, and mm. that if it's not nipped in the bud and left unattended, you know, that can really sped, spread quite quickly throughout yeah the team like have you had any experiences about that sorry with that um and you know what do you sort of do when you know that someone's getting a bit funny starting to get a bit jaded and that sort of stuff how do you yeah it's um it's interesting because i take that when people get upset and uh and are negative about stuff which ultimately is the path they start on before they resign yes um, i take resignation very very personally (laughs) Which in some respects makes me a very, very bad, uh, very bad leader, um, because you know, it's, and, and I described it to we, we've got a, a new, uh, you know, well not new, they've been a couple of years now, but we've got a couple of guys down in Sydney and Melbourne who are leading their teams, um, so they're on a similar journey to, to what I've been on, uh, but obviously more local. Um, and one of the guys down in Sydney, they had one of his in Melbourne actually, one of his guys resigned. Uh, and the way I explained it to him is I said, you're going to go through this curve. He said, what do you mean? He said, well, you're going to start off with denial, but it's not your fault. And, uh, and you'll try and convince this person that they've got to stay and you'll throw things at them to try and make them stay because you don't want, you won't cope with the rejection world to start with. And then, you know, if that conversation continues and that person digs their heels in and they're, no, they're definitely going, you'll end up in this kind of period of denial where, it's uh, where you'll be, where you'll be upset, and then you'll be accepting of it almost instantaneously. Of right, well, fine, they want to move on. Screw them. We're better off without them, kind of attitude. And then you'll come out the other way, and you'll be like, okay, it's not great that they've left, but um, but we but we'll find somebody better. We'll we'll improve because of it. We'll we'll use this as a learning curve. So that'll be the curve that we'll go through. And he didn't. He blamed me for one. <laughs> Um, uh, but then a week later, he rang me up and he said, you're absolutely right. That's exactly what I did. I was complete denial, then accepting, and then we'll get better. And I said, and now I've been doing this now five years. Now I've been managing people for longer than five years, but while we've been on this kind of, like, like the book does stop with me to a certain extent in terms of people, whether they're happy or sad or leaving or staying. 
it does all kind of stop with me to an extent. And I'm still at that point where I take it personally. I probably don't throw my toys at the pram as loudly as I used to. Uh, yep. and, I'm, and I'm probably making a call earlier now based on culture uh, of, right, because of the conversations we've had with that individual, um, are they a right fit for our team in terms of what we're looking for? And based on those conversations, no, probably not. So don't want to lose them, but it's probably not a bad thing they're leaving. That's the kind of rationale that I've now kind of come to. But when it comes to people being upset, it's about that communication. It's about having that open dialogue. You may not be able to set. You may not be able to sell them. You may not be able to make them happy. But at least by having that conversation, you're opening the door. Uh, I've worked at plenty of conversations where the door was just never open. Yeah, and that's that's when it festers. Um, I've now taken to when somebody's leaving, sending emails to the whole team to say this person's leaving. This is what they've done with us. Wish them all the best. Whereas previously, right, when I was really taking it badly. It was a case of I was just silent on the subject because I didn't know how to address it. So yeah. I like to think that I've matured a little bit in the last couple of years. And it also comes down to the fact that when you're a small team, one person leaving can have a big impact in terms of totally. workload and other people's stress and all the rest of it. And my stress of trying to fill that gap in terms of further recruitment and all the rest of it. So now that we're on this trajectory, of, I mean, we've had a couple of people, one person leaves in the last week. Uh, we've got another person who's leaving in the next, um, you know, in, in, in the next few weeks. Uh, we've got four people starting. In the next, we had two people start this week and we've got another two people starting in the next month. So the trajectory is changing now. Yes. If somebody's leaving for whatever reason, either something personal from their end, and one person who left said, I love working with you guys. I think it's a great team. I'm just not uh, that excited to buy some of the products we're working on. Fair enough. Very little we can do about that at yeah. this moment in time. So it's not all leaving because people don't like the culture. It's because there are other things potentially in play. Oh, now absolutely. that we're on this trajectory of increasing the team, the loss of one person isn't felt as much as it is because we're, you know, we're on this big growth cycle at this moment yeah. in time. So it's about looking at everything in kind of retrospect in terms of how does this all balance out in the scheme of things. And I've moved on from the if one person leaves, it, it's terrible. It's terrible for our culture. It's terrible, you know, people talk, it's like, but that's because I've grown up in cultures where Every time somebody left, there was a story behind it. And it was never nipped in the bud. And it was never talked about by senior leadership. I remember handing my office in at a relatively you know, global firm and senior management stopped talking to me yeah. because I'd resigned. That is the yeah. culture that I don't And the know. whole burning the bridges thing, I said, like, the industry is too small, right? Like, you're better off. Yeah. And, and, like, to your point before, I had a really good mentor early on in my, when I still said, well, still am a civil engineer, but when I was in my civil engineering role, just say, you know, when someone resigns, like I was in a team leader position, then you do, you just, you, yeah, maybe there's a sick feeling in your stomach about, oh, you know, like, how am I going to manage this? But you just yeah. thank, thank them for their time. You don't throw the, the, the toys out of the cot. You just um, go back to your desk and the first thing you do is just pen a nice email to the team and just go mm. such and such is leaving. Um, they finish up with us in four weeks. Their last day is here. Um, over the course of working with us, they've achieved these three to five great things. We thank them for their time or service and, you know, wish them well. And that's just one, you know, you're, you're being the, uh, the, the, you're being the, the big person in the whole situation in terms yeah. of, you know, addressing it Two, you know, you're not letting those rumors start to fester and, and, yeah. and that yeah, sort exactly. of stuff. Yeah. Well, um, it, well, three, it, yeah. well, you just never know where they're going to turn up. They might go to the next role and hate it and come back. So they could have gone work for a client. Yeah. Is the other thing as well. Um, and it's interesting when, when you use that term, don't burn your bridges. I mean, that, that's that been around in the industry, any industry for, for many, many years. Um, but it's interesting is that when I think back now, that phrase was always used by senior people to junior people, mm -hmm. as in make sure you leave in the right way, make sure you don't burn your bridges with us. But it's a two-way street. Bridges go bridges go, go both, both ways. So when, you know, going back to my example of senior leaders in the business no longer talking to me or even acknowledging my existence in my notice period, is that a company that I'm going to go back to? No. Do you think that's a story that I've told other people in the industry? <laughs> so it's like, you know, it's, but, you know, bridges go both ways. So it's just as much for, for leaders and senior managers to be doing the I right think, thing. By I that think more so. Like, yeah, I think absolutely. I think our industry does it poorly in terms of you know they're almost you're dead to me kind of thing when you leave and so I think yeah, there's and that was definitely a phase I went through. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, how how do you 
Having hard conversations is hard, right? Particularly when you know someone is a bit disgruntled and frustrated. How do you go about broaching that? How do you go about opening up that door? So a lot of times when people are frustrated, disgruntled, overwhelmed, Mm -hmm. stressed, they tend to close down. And, you know, how do you go about opening that door up so you can have an open, honest communication? Well, it's difficult. It it does all come down to the individual. We're back to people again. It comes down to individuals um, and how they want to approach it. Because I've got, you know, there are some people on the team who, if they're disgruntled about something or or don't disagree with how we bid a project or how we're delivering something, they are more than vocal about how they feel about the subject. And sometimes you just want people to just take a step and just back off a little bit and just think about what you want to get out of this. Because it's very easy to come across as negative rather than, you know, constructive criticism and having a solution in mind sometimes it can just look like you're just throwing barbs just to you know just to try and get something off your chest when it comes to that you know people being discriminatory and having that open conversation it does come down to the individual to try and broach it i am very very bad at hard conversations i don't mind saying that because i'm terrified of difficult conversations and if somebody's already got an opinion or a perception about something i'm terrified about making it worse Yes. So I tend, to, I, t- I tend to avoid the conversations or historically I've tended to avoid the conversations. I think I have got a little bit better lately and some of it is about just one, inviting the conversation, uh, which has definitely been a bit of a curve for me because you know it's just that hurdle to try and get over. It's like, I know this is going to be a difficult conversation, but let's try and have it. It's better to, to try and drive that conversation earlier rather than to the point where that person's had enough and they're and they're trying to leave, particularly if you, you know, if you see them as a big part of the of your future growth. Yep. Um, so yeah, it is difficult, but some of it is just about giving them the airtime, giving them the airtime to get something off their chest, and then you can respond. Um, how they respond to some of your feedback is usually where things can fall down, because you could say, right, this is this is how the issue from where I'm sitting. Uh, and you know. Yes, there are these things that are happening here that we can try and fix. You as an individual, though, need to, and we've had this conversation with somebody recently, that you know, you as an individual need to step up in this regard. They didn't want to hear that bit because it was only about the issues as they saw them. Yes. And that's, as a manager, that's where I get, I get a little bit frustrated because the one thing that drives me nuts in the world is people who have a complete lack of self-awareness about their actions and their responses to stuff and, and how they're perceived. I'm I'm the opposite on the very fact that I constantly second guess myself in case I say or do something that could be perceived in the manner that I don't want it to be perceived. So I'm constantly second guessing myself. And there are other people who don't seem to have that issue at all and just blurt out whatever comes into comes into their head. So um so that's a bit of a frustration for me. But uh but yeah, it's about inviting the conversation and and trying to guide the conversation in the right kind of way. It doesn't always work because you're dealing with people and people yeah. will respond positively to what you're saying or they won't. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I mean, that probably leads nicely into talking about the EQ piece and emotional intelligence. Like how, how important has that been for you to kind of, and, you know, from our conversations before we mm. caught up and obviously our conversation today, like you, you come across as the type of person that is quite aware of, you know, yourself, your words, the impact you have on other people. Um, you've used the word number of times, depends on the type of personality type mm. and depends on the person. Like, and they're all sort of, you know, indicators or traits of, of that emotional intelligence or emotional awareness. Mm. Is that something you've always had or you've had to consciously sort of develop that as you've oh, come I've, through your I've career? Definitely, I've definitely had to consciously develop it. Um, now, I've always suspected to an extent that I've got Asperger's, never been diagnosed, but my son's got Asperger's. So, okay. you know, and he's supposed to be hereditary. So my wife constantly says, well, it's your fault, obviously. Um, because <laughs> that's, the, well, that, that's the relationship we have. So nobody should feel like I'm getting domestically abused there. Okay. She's probably right. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so that kind of EQ that, you know, I don't, you know, I, I don't like those kind of badges because I think if you, if you are a leader in a business, the good leaders, are, the good leaders I've, I've worked for in the past and the people I would run through a wall for are the people who are good technically, but they know how to manage people. They know how to have conversations. They know how to you know, drive people in the right kind of way. Um, the people who, and who, who, who I really wouldn't follow into any kind of my, uh, firefight um, are the people who are all driven by process and try and treat everybody, you're, you're, you're at this level, therefore you need to be doing X, Y, and Z. And there's an element of that, but it's that 
understanding that everyone's doing. The way I've described it to a lot of the people in our leadership team is, uh, you know, the more senior you get, it's more about psychology than it is about anything else. Yes, you've got to be good technically in your job. You've got to be able to train people. You've got to be able to deliver services. You've got to be able to speak openly to clients. You know, there's all that kind of stuff that is very, from a client-facing technical standpoint, that you will need as a kind of business unit leader. Um, but the more people you manage, it's all psychology. So you've got to, and you've got to approach every conversation differently because when you're addressing a group, right? Um, you know, and I do plenty of, I do a fair bit of speaking and uh, sitting on panels and addressing people on my team. And when you're addressing it, you think you've got the vision right, you've got the story right, you're articulating it in the right kind of way. And some people, you look at the faces and it's like that person's completely disengaged with what I'm saying and other people are really engaged. I'm never going to be able to come up with any presentation or speech that is going to equally have everybody engaged at the same time, regardless of what we see in American sitcoms and all that. <laughs> yeah. People punching the air and giving whoops and Mexican waves and stuff. Um, but uh, So it's the same thing on one-on-one -on -one conversations. You can't approach, like every time you do a performance review, that performance re uh, review has almost got to be cultivated in a way that suits that individual. Because if you try and do the same thing with Jack that you did with Sue, it's never going to work because they just respond differently to different triggers. And one thing that isn't a trigger for one person will be for somebody else. So and none of us in any kind of leadership role have done any kind of psychology training or anything like that. This is all kind of stuff that you pick up through, through uh, being mentored and through working for good, you know, for good leaders um, and just taking those kind of lessons. Um, the, worst lead, the worst leaders I've worked for are the ones who've always been promoted into a leadership role because they're technically very, very good and they're bringing lots of work. But my yeah. God, they can't handle people. No. Um, and I think and that's, that's a lot of what's wrong with the industry to an extent. 100%. I was just going to say that because, you know, my journey over the years was looking at, like I could probably on my hand count the, the number of inspirational people I work for when I was you know, in the engineering consultancy, people who really just got people and got the whole exactly what you just said you have to tailor communication based on someone's personality style and you have to read the room and and mm. you know work out you know is this being received and i actually interviewed a gentleman on the podcast four or five five episode ago and he talks a lot about eq and that's been mm. his success in building his business around um and he used the example of if he goes into a conversation with someone mm. and can just see a might be a feedback it might be a bit of a hey you know we just need to have a chat about what's going on mm. and he can see that he bombed it or didn't quite land it correctly he will instantly just go okay thanks um we'll leave the situation think about it um about yeah. how he could better approach it and tailor it and go hey sue or jack can we catch up again i didn't quite you know i didn't quite get across what what you know i wanted to in our last catch up and completely rethinks and retailers his approach based on not only the feedback he got in that sort of initial interaction, but also just, you know, sitting down, thinking about the person, how they'd like to be communicated to, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And that for him has been the biggest single success yeah. in terms of building culture is that self-awareness. I mean, when we have these conversations about EQ, and I've seen plenty of leaders you know, on podcasts like this and panel discussions and stuff talk about it, when they're talking about it, it's almost like they have the formula. They have it cracked. You know, this is what they do and everybody in their company loves them to a certain extent. And I'm not saying that's what they're trying to get across. That's how, that's how it's perceived. That's how it comes across. Um, and I've, um, you know, through this conversation now, talking about the stuff that I'm doing from an EQ perspective and from a psychology perspective and how I'm trying to temper conversations with the individual in mind, I'm sounding like I've got it sorted and that uh, everybody in, in my business unit is like loves working for me. And, and it's not, that's not the case. I'm terrified that people are going to, listen to this and say, well, that's not my experience. It's like, no, that last conversation we had, you got that completely wrong. And it's like, <laughs> but <laughs> could we, could we generalize? Right. Um, but I'm always conscious of being an opposite to what I'm saying. That For sure. The stuff that I've tried hasn't worked with an individual or in a particular conversation or a particular kind of presentation. And yeah. I think it's, I think it's, you know, it's certainly of value to be honest about that. Um, because, you can come at these conversations and listen to these podcasts and feel like certain people have got it made, certain people have found the secret source, they know exactly what they're doing when it comes to managing people. And the truth is, we're still making it as we go along. We're just, oh, getting totally. better, we're just getting better at it. But there will always be something that comes out of left field that you haven't experienced before or prepared for. 
and well, you're learning again. Yeah. Well, it's approaching it with growth mindset, right? Like it's, you know, yeah. the conversation you and I are having right now is us conversing about the sum total of our experiences in our life to date. And that's not to say that tomorrow we're going to have a different experience that completely flips or changes what we talked about yeah. um, in, the, in this session. And it's about really approaching life with that um, learning mindset. Like I, I'm always yeah. here, I'm always learning, I'm always growing. Um, I'm happy to challenge my beliefs and I'm happy to challenge the way I did things a year ago because, you know, I did that a year ago because I thought that was the best way, but I've learned yeah. over the last year that it's not or I can get yeah. better. And so, you know, we do things from, a, uh, whether it's from a delivery perspective or from a business planning perspective or, you know, just how we're building a strategy and a structure for the team, et cetera. I look back on things that I did two years ago and I cringe thinking, my God, that was like <laughs> amateur hour. But at the time, it was the best thing that I ever did. Yep. It was the best approach. It was like, uh, yeah, this is gonna this is gonna turn some heads, this is gonna be great. And I look back now thinking, why did I do that? It was awful. How did anybody think that was good? Um, because we develop, we grow. Yeah, and 100%. you know, what was good two years ago is kind of vanilla now. So it's it is it's the people who continue to do what they were doing two years ago. And that's not just about managing people, that's about how we deal with projects, that's about how we engage with clients. You know, I, I work in a profession that hasn't really changed how we do things in the last 30, 40 years. It's a part of the culture has been, how do we actually change that? How do we actually try and drive something differently and show clients a different set of value? And that comes back to the culture as well. And again, you know, not just saying, like I've worked at companies before that have tried, you know, inverted commas, innovation. And it's basically some people at the top of the table saying, we're going to do this and expect everybody to follow. That's not how innovation works. You've got to get everybody in the team from your cadets and your graduates through to participate in some way in what that solution could look like. 100%. And when you do that, you end up with a, a you know with a solution that anybody in your team would be happy to go and speak to a client about because they all feel invested. They all feel like they're engaged. When they're told what the innovation is, you never get the engagement. And yeah. that comes that, back down to that culture and strategy again. And I think too, you know, as long as you are turning up every day with the intention to be the best version of yourself and put the best foot forward um no one can really accuse you of getting it wrong i guess you know no you, but it's also about being vulnerable as well it's yeah. also about um you know sometimes i turn up to the office and i'm in a foul and the kids have been awful trying to get to the school you know they've missed the bus i've had to take them in they've just been windy why i'm, I'm talking about a 17 year old kid and a 13 year old <laughs> Since you're born a 13 year old girl. So, you know, I've got, I've got moods central coming out of our house at the moment. Um, and that kind of thing knocks the stuffing out you in the morning and you get into the you've got a hard meeting. I don't think there's anything wrong with telling people that you're struggling that day. Yeah. Um, it's some of the worst leaders I've worked for, some of the, you know, the work um, in terms of those managers, the people who try and put a bright face on everything. And try and have this kind of false bravado, false enthusiasm, and you can read it. You can read it's like, but God, that doesn't seem genuine at all. Mm. Um, because everybody in my team, whether they're a cadet, associate director, whatever, they're all going to have days where they're like, I cannot be bothered with today. It's going to be too hard. I just want to crawl, you know, crawl into bed and not, not get out for a couple of days. I think as a manager, you've got to show that you're on the same boat because you know people need to know that it's okay to feel like that. I mean, not all the time because you don't get any work done. But you know what I mean. It's, you've, <laughs> yeah. got to, you, you've, you've got to show that vulnerability to say, "I'm in the same boat." Yeah, I'm not doing exactly the same work as you. I'm you know, doing something that's slightly different, but it doesn't mean I don't feel the same. Yeah, totally, um, mate. I just want to shift gears a little bit and talk about um, the industry at the moment, but more importantly, like winning work. So, what do you what do you see is working well now for? businesses in the industry in terms of securing a good pipeline of work, deepening mm. and developing client relationships, that kind of thing. Like what's working well from your point of view? Oh, it's, it's a mixed bag. Um, like I said, you know, the same thing with managing people, and managing teams. There's no kind of secret sauce to it. Um, there's, you know, the what works well we found with one client isn't working with another client. And you've got to try and change tactics. Because we ate love with axe people again. Everyone's got slightly <laughs> different motivations. Funny that. Like, yeah, funny, funny how we keep coming back to that. Um, but you know, we're finding certainly the innovation angle, trying to do things differently with some of the stuff that we've developed, is getting traction with some clients, not all clients. Um, you know, we show the all our clients the same kind of thing, and they're all amazed by it. But when it comes to tendering the project, they still make the same kind of, they still select based on the same buying principles of, 
existing relationships based on level of fee, PI, contractual ease, all that kind of thing. So we are seeing a bit of a, a you know, a, a discontinuation there of what people say that they want versus how they actually buy with certain clients. But then there are some clients who we've, you know, we've demonstrated, you know, we've shown them some of the stuff that we've got, we've let them have a look under the hood and they've been completely blown away by it and we're right. doing my, the majority of their work. And there's other clients we're on, we've started that journey with. So it really depends on, on the individual client. Um, and like I said, there's no secret sauce. And anybody who thinks they've got it sorted in terms of sales, in terms of how to win work, they haven't. They'll have it sorted for a couple of clients and potentially, potentially a couple of different client profiles. Um, but it all it, invariably, it all comes down to relationships. It all comes down to the level of connectedness that you've got and, and, and how much you, I suppose, invest in a client in terms of time. Like we just um, you, you alluded to it at the start, where I've just done this kind of whirlwind tour up and down the East Coast, presenting uh, one of our global reports to to a lot of clients. Now that itself has opened the door to a couple of clients that we're not actually working with at this moment in time, and we don't have a very strong relationship. But with the very fact that we've invested a bit of time, showed them some different insights, had a different type of conversation to what they probably normally have, that's opened the door to a couple of opportunities. Now we still have to convert those opportunities. And invariably, it will come down to price at some some point. And we all want to live in a world where we all charge what we're worth and the client accepts it and buys it. That's not going to happen for a long, long time because everyone's still focused on bottom dollar to a certain Mm -hmm. extent. And that's one of the negatives about the industry, that there is a lot of um, lower price-driven activity. Yep. Um, But, but yeah, so it's about opening those doors and and trying to see what works. And it's a a constantly moving beast and constantly evolving. Mate, 100%. And it does, it comes down to people deepening relationships. And it's interesting, like you look at personality profiles, personality types, and people in, in BD roles are often very good at developing relationships and repeat business from clients who are exactly the same as them because they, yeah. they know how to talk to them. They know what they mm-hmm. like, that kind of thing. That the real challenge and opportunity is to go, okay, well, I've got that, you know, one of four personality style nailed. Mm-hmm. How do I go and generate business from the other you know, different personality styles. And it's that, it is that EQ piece and, and understanding yeah. people. How do you tailor your, your conversation, your pitch, your proposal to that person so that they love what you're talking about? And, um, you know, that's the ongoing yeah, challenge. I'm, I've got a bit of sympathy with salespeople. Um, I shouldn't really say this out, <coughs> I shouldn't really say this out loud. Uh, but, uh, you know, the, the people who do business development is, particularly if they've moved, Industries and, and organisations where you know one one minute they're selling civil engineering, next minute they're selling project management. Um, I've got a bit, you know, it must be hard to try and be selling like civil engineering one minute from a business development perspective, and then move to a project management firm and suddenly be all in. We're the best project manager in the world, but I'm selling it kind of thing. Yeah, I've always I have I do struggle with that model, and there are some people who are very very good at it. Don't get me wrong, but. That's a model, you know, I, I do prefer the seller do a model because I like being able to talk to a client technically and knowledgeably about sure. my industry, my market, my service. Those who don't deliver the service, selling it, I've never quite understood that. It does come across at times a bit, you know, like a car salesman to a certain extent. There's a but like, I, I will hasten to add there are plenty of people who are very, very good at it. I'm not having a pop at anyone. But <laughs> that, that model of this is just selling for the sake of selling, yeah, I... I, I in, in a technical profession, I do struggle with that. Yep, 100%. Um, mates, final question. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, if you look back over your career and, you know, all the things that have worked and haven't worked and, you know, obviously you're the, the sum total of all of your experiences, lessons, learnings, wins, failure, mm-hmm. and you get the opportunity to catch up with a 10-year younger version of yourself. Um, oh, I hate these questions. <laughs> Come on, <laughs> what what advice would you give yourself? Um, so I would probably go back a bit more than ten years. Actually, okay, uh, good. I'd go back to I would probably have been about I was a grad, so I would have been about three years into the industry, um, and it was looking back now, it's exactly what needed to happen to kind of fuel the career that I've had. But at the time, it was like a six month period of the worst period of my life to a certain extent. What happened was I was working as a grad in London. I was, uh, uh, I was, and you know, I was working on a project, and it was a project that I was pretty much running independently at that point. 
I, I had a partner overseeing them and stuff, but I was doing a lot of the day to day. Anyway, without going into all the details, a couple of things happened. There were a few mistakes made on some of the cost reports. Um, and the mistake I made was one, not owning up to the mistake to start with. But two, I found the mistake before anybody else had found it. And instead of owning up to it, I tried to hide it, which all that did was make the problem worse. Yes. And after a couple of more months, it finally came out. And I was dragged over the coals for about six months. Uh, and it was really, really tough. Um, and you know, they, you know, the company in question actually talked about should we let him go? Because yeah, you know, it was that bad and we had to, a lot of ground to make up on the client. Mm-hmm. Now I'll openly admit that's a mistake I made. There's plenty of people who just kind of put it under the covers and just not 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 open the, the lid again. Um, but um if I was going to go back to myself now, going back to that guy who's 23, 24 years old, it'd be a case of take it on the chin and own up to it. Don't try and hide it. And I've never hidden anything, any other mistake. I've, I've, it has been front and centre ever since. Because we all make mistakes. There's always going to be a mistake. There's always going to be a figure that's transposed in the spreadsheet or it's going to be something that doesn't quite calculate or just something inputted plain wrong. Those mistakes happen all the time. Whether you're an engineer, whether you're a QS, whether you're a project manager, it's owning up to them and owning up to it as early as possible. So the biggest mistake I made was trying to hide it and not coming clean. And it was through fear more than anything else. But the bizarre thing was the culture that we had in our business wasn't a culture of fear. It was actually quite an open team that these issues come out. Yeah, you might get your hand slapped and somebody might raise a voice at you, but we'd figure the way, the way through. And I did the complete opposite of that. So that's the, that's the one thing that even now, you know, 20, more than 20 years on, I still think about that, that cock up. Mate, good advice. <laughs> Um, Matthew, mate, thank you so much for you know agreeing to catch up today. I have like the time's gone super quick. I've enjoyed the conversation, mate. Um, it's flowed really well. Where can people follow along your journey? Uh, so, well, I'm obviously I'm, I'm on LinkedIn. Um, yep. Anybody who knows me knows that I'm on LinkedIn a lot. Uh, yep. So I've, I've usually got something to say on there. Uh, but yeah, and yeah, I think you can get me through the, the website as well. Uh, and. And there's, I don't, we never really got a chance to talk about it, but there's a networking group in Brisbane as well called oh, we didn't. Brisbane the, that we're involved in. There's a website for that, propertyleadersbrisbane.org. Have we got the, email, uh, the web address correct? Where we do events all the time. I'm usually at those events. So, yeah, just find, find me on LinkedIn. Hey, good. Thank you so much. No worries. Thanks very much, Josh. It's been a pleasure. Easy.